When I was young, we had these crazy ideas. We imagined that one day we'd be able to stop rushing around and let all our work be done for us by robots. We may not yet have robots, but these days our homes are chock-a-block with willing helpers that seem to get more useful all the time. That's what this program is all about. The mechanics of domestic life. Those willing servants around the home that help make life easy. As a designer, I love to see how these servants have developed. Sometimes they've taken revolutionary leaps, at other times simple refinements have come up with the goods. But they've all helped free us from the worst excesses of drudgery. I often talk on television about domestic problems. And here's another problem, Black Monday. Every housewife knows what that means. Give it some effort like that. It's work. I have a vague recollection of my mother's drudge-ridden working week as, as just being all graft, really. Um, and it seemed to be full of washing and dampness and lots of tasks. And as a little child, I seemed to think that, how did she manage to cope with that week? It was incredibly hard work. Monday began the week, washing day, and it did take you all day to do the washing. You had to be really tough in those days. People did work physically a lot harder. We didn't have any of the labour-saving devices that we have these days. One of the earliest pieces of wash day technology was this, the washboard. Simple piece of technology which mimics scrubbing your clothes on the old rocks in the old river. It's not a complicated piece of technology, but it was a huge leap forward because we could actually do our washing inside with hot water. Big advantage. And wash day was stood on its head by the dolly or posting. For the first time we moved the stick, not the washing. You would plunge that up and down. Um, often two people would work at the same time, which they call double possing. Oh. One up, one down. And this was the early form, really, of what became mechanised and um, developed into the washing machine uh, as we know it. Don't let all the steel and bright colours fool you. Even though it's driven by electricity, this 1930s model is still just a stick twisting in the water. In the affluent 50s, they may have dressed up the machines to give us our first sleek white goods, but the only technical advance was that they heated their own water. The 60s saw the supremacy of the twin tool, but even with an early timer, it still needed watching, tending, looking after. Still a bit manual, we've still got this manual process, but this was the must-have product of the 60s. Hey, and away we go. Oh, it's evocative, it's all coming flooding back, I feel it now. But the replacement for the twin tub would wash away all competition, the front-loading automatic. Front loaders were a revolution. Up to the 60s, we did our washing in a, well, a bucket really. The washing went round and round and round in a vertical tub. But in the 60s, with our fitted kitchen lifestyles, we turned that bucket sideways so that it would fit into our fitted kitchens. How does that work? How do we keep that water in there? With a front loader, we bung our washing into the drum like that and whack it inside and we've got an incredible rubber seal that holds the washing and all that water inside. And we've got this fantastic, nice, lifestyle, smooth white exterior. But inside, we've got this whacking great drum with a washing inside it that permanently wants to get down, gravity being what it is. The washing wants to push that drum all the, down all the time as it spins round. So we've got two whacking great weights, top and bottom, to stabilise the whole thing so the whole thing doesn't go vibrating off. But I can show you in a much better way, really.
let's have a proper look inside. Now here's our drum with all the washing in it, and here's down there is a little motor. And that little motor will get hold of the drum and shake it all about with your washing inside if it wasn't for these big concrete lumps here, which are counterbalances to stop the whole thing vibrating away. Oops, I've almost forgot my washing. Perfect. The greatest advance in washing machines is that they're automatic. We can actually set them to do the job and walk away. And this was originally controlled by a mechanical process, almost like clockwork here. It's a little device that we set it with a real positive motion here, and it sets all these little con contacts, and off it goes. Today, this is all done by a series of microchips. It's a microprocessor. But, and this tickles me as a designer, is that we need a, rem a remnant of an old technology to make us feel right. The control operates the timer, but the click itself does nothing. It just makes it feel like we're in control. We know what we're doing. Modern detergents, of course, and efficient washing machines have made washing much easier. But that still leaves us with the problem of how to get the clothes dry for ironing quickly and easily. In the 19th century, the best way to get your clothes dry was the mangle, squeezing the water out. Buttons were always a casualty, but the arrival of electricity made mangles lethal. Trap fingers became so common that hospitals ran special mangle clinics across the land. People began to experiment with other ways of getting your clothes dry. And as you can see, we've spared no expense on this um, dramatic reconstruction. Well... What I have here is a working model of one of the very earliest forms of tumble dryer. You put your clothes in here thus, hopefully they stay in there, and then we rotate, or they were rotated, over a burning fire. The electric tumble dryer was invented in America in 1938. But like so many things, we got it much later. And it wasn't available in this country till 1958. Rudimentary though this may look, perhaps a little bit too simple, it's exactly the same principle as a tumble dryer. All we really need to do is rotate the clothing so that hot air can get in amongst the fibres and dry it out and all the hot air and damp air can actually pass through the, the framework and away. Now if you'd like your clothes singed and smelling of smoke, that was obviously okay. But I think, I think you'll probably agree that the current electric versions are much more efficient and, and nicer to use. And let's, hope, let's see if that's dry. Marvellous. There we are. I think you'll agree, there's just one or two snakes to iron out. We've been ironing in this country since the Vikings introduced smoothing storms. Love is a burning thing. But the iron as we know it today arrived in the 16th century, and its shape hasn't changed since. All that has is how it gets hot. You have a whole range of these flat irons on the fire getting warm as this one's cooling down. Judging the heat of irons like this was a skill acquired through painful trial and error. So you have to remember that people were much more used to handling um, hot things, coal or um, wood with the basic forms of heating in the household and so people were much more skilled and very much more wary of the heat. I fell into a, burning ring of fire. a variation was the ingot iron which took the fire to the iron by inserting a slug of hot metal into the body of the iron itself. The ring of fire. The ring but my favourite of these old designs is this one with burning coals inside and I'll show you why. Eventually this is going to go cold, so we don't go and get another ingot or some more coals. We actually pop in the bellows. Now this pushes the air through the coals, gets them nice and glowing red hot, and keeps that heat going. In actual fact, there's a little chimney there, so the, the air would pass right through the iron. It's like carrying your own fireplace around, but the smoke was pretty smelly. 
Electric irons were a clean alternative. Invented in 1880, they became widely available after the First World War. Surprisingly, at first, housewives were wary of electric irons. Think of it, all that power and heat in your hand seemed dangerous. But they were so much cleaner and more convenient than anything that had gone before that they became incredibly popular. So by the start of the Second World War, they reckoned that four out of five homes with electricity had an electric iron. They were a breakthrough product and hold the title of first popular electric appliance. Housework was getting easier by the decade. People thought electric irons were dangerous, but what about these? I've got electricity and water side by side in one hand. But this was the ultimate design. They got the shape of the iron right from the start. Now with heat and water combined, steam irons became one of those perfect products that it's hard to fault. Phew, time for a quick cuppa. You didn't think it'd be that easy, did you? 100 years ago, how long would it take to boil a kettle? With this. Well, let's have a look. First, we need some heat, and the heat here is a fire, and we've got to get this fire going. And to do that, we've got to get this bellows going, we've got to get some air through it, we've got to get a nice blaze going. Now, this is a daily task performed by the lady of the house who would have to run the house, clean the house, all with the hot water generated in this kettle. Now, this is work. I've stopped. I'm, tired with, I'm, work, I'm worked out already and we haven't even started to scrub floors and scrub shirts. And you see those little old Victorian ladies coming around in the morning for the cappuccinos with biceps about a foot wide. This should be an Olympic event. Look out Steve Redgrid, mate. This does give you the strength. Oh, I think it's perhaps getting a little bit too hot. But where's the off button? Where's the off button? No switch, no button. Because there's no in instant cut-off. It's all got to be worked at. Just too hot for me. Whoa, this, this is heavy. And it's heavy because it's cast iron. It's not plastic, it's not aluminium, it's cast iron. And that's, it's heavy before we even get any water in it. So let's get some water in it. Let's get the old pump going. And this is an old tub, it's not a tap, it's not a main, it's nothing like that. This is a rain tub. Of course, in the old days, this would be from a trough or from a well or something like that. And again, it involves work. Oh dear me. Just think people are going to bath in this and drink it. Oh, let's get it done. Ah. Oh, right there. Now, how long will this take?